Um, good morning. I think we have some people from multiple time zones, so good afternoon and good evening, if such is the case. Um, it's just been wonderful <laughs> to be interacting with technology in this way. Um, as someone who is in the field of technology more from the artificial intelligence world, um, <laughs> it really is wonderful that um, people who hadn't been used to working in technology in this particular environment are now becoming pros at it. So uh, thank you everybody for joining the class. I think this is going to be a really exciting um, class simply because we are going to be um, hopefully go seeing, having an entire map of how we humans have thought about ourselves with respect to robotics, with respect to technology in general, and simply with respect to what it means to be human. And I hope that really when we walk through not only history of uh, humanoid robots and also the development of cognitive science and artificial intelligence and all the way up where we are today with respect to humanoid robots, that when we go through the different literary texts, that we really get a world view. I really try to provide different authors from around the world. This is a super, super, super fast uh, condensed version of a class actually that I uh, recently did uh, here at Hopkins uh, for the incoming freshmen. And so um, I realized that there are many works of literature out there and uh, there are even some that have not been translated into English that are fantastic. And so I really, it was actually quite difficult to find the right type of text that I wanted to make sure that everybody at least had access to um, and that we could discuss. Um, so that was certainly a challenge and hopefully that will also become part of the conversation because I'm sure there are people here in the audience, you participants who are also aware and knowledgeable about other texts. So of course, I want this to not be something that, you know, just because these, this is the list of works we'll be reading, that, you know, it's the, the thing that's written in stone. It's completely open to also hearing about your experiences with other texts as well. So um, just right now, before I enter into um, our uh, love affair with machines, um, I just want to do some really quick housekeeping with respect to the class. So typically what's going to happen, so not for today, because today I'm going to go through this really brief history of our love affair with the machines, and I'm going to show you a few videos. But starting next week, what I'm going to do is start off with the background of the author and the whole entire, really talk about the scientific and the technological landscape in which that author was, was writing in. And then I'm going to pose several questions about the reading so that we can really have an engaged discussion. So we are not going to do a uh, literary analysis of the text simply because there isn't time for that. Um, so it, in that sense, it will be important that if you can please make the effort to read as much as you can so that we can have a lively discussion. Uh, so that, that's going to be how we're going to run each week. And then, of course, uh, the final week, the sixth uh, week, six week in September, that will be really open and discussion. I'm, I, of course, I can start um, myself with a few things I've written um, to sort of get us going and then completely open the floor to you. So today, um, I will hopefully, I'm gonna, I have a lot of slides I wanna go through, um, but um, hopefully I will, I wanna make sure I've uh, put some time at the end for your questions, comments, and any inspiration that comes about that you can share with, okay? Um, so let's just jump right in. Okay, so the word robot, um, that actually is a contemporary word. It comes from the Czech robotnik, uh, which actually literally means forced worker or slave. And this particular word was introduced by Karol Kapek, who was a Czech writer. Um, it was introduced in 1920, and actually it was uh, primarily used, it was first used uh, in his work, RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots one of the works we are going to be reading. Uh, and that was a theatrical play. And, uh, and so I, I mentioned this because, you know, we use the word robot all the time. And if this is a concept that actually has quite a history, it really is fascinating for those of you who like to see sort of the origin of words, that this is something that actually is only, in fact, a century old as a, as a concept, as a, as a word per, per se. Um, and these uh, images right here 
are just screenshots from the play that was done, that was produced in the 1920s of Carol Kopeck's um, actual work. And so um, I'm not going to talk about the play right now simply because we are going to read it and we're going to get to talk about it more. But I just wanted to introduce this to you now so that you know that this, the word really came from uh, Kopeck's work. And uh, the word also had, so from the 1920s, and really I would say more around the 1950s and upwards, is when it's, we started to see the word autonoma, android, humanoid, cyborgs kind of being used synonymously. They do not all mean the same thing, and I will break down in more specifics how they differ. Uh, but generally when we talk about ourselves in relationship to our mechanical selves or our organic selves in relation to our the mechanical our mechanical selves when we don't use the word robot we tend to use therefore um, the words automaton automata androids humanoids or cyborgs so I do want to mention uh, now in terms of because we are going to be focusing on literary works that there are three big questions that come up. And I try to condense them here so that you can really keep them in the back of your mind as we read the literary works. So one of the questions I've noticed that storytellers tend to pose with respect to this question of robotics or automata or android is what if a character happened to be made out of nuts and bolts and software or even created out of synthetic flesh. So in devising the stories that we're going to be reading, this you'll see that in most, in all the stories really, um, the question of what if there were one character or many characters that had one or many of these particular characteristics. So what does this mean for creating a narrative? A second question that comes up is what would civilization look like if androids liberated humans from the work they perform today? So this tends to be a very recurring theme um, in not only the works that we're reading for this particular course, uh, but many, most of the science fiction related to humanoid robots is, well, what happens, you know, if we um, give these androids uh, the task, we allow them to do tasks that we humans do all the time, then what does that mean for our world? Does that change? our perception of the world? Does that change even our work behaviors? Does it change what it means to be a human? And then finally, a third question that also comes up is that continuing from the second question is, would these androids ever be exploited by their, their creators? Or what if they develop a coming interest of their own? So what does this mean? Well, this means that, you know, when we give androids, when we give these machines, these human-like looking machines, and who not, so I do want to make sure, uh, do want to make clear that not necessarily do the androids have to look like us um, in many of the story, and some of the stories will be, um, actually in the stories we will be reading, they, the robots do look like us, so they are the humanoid robot. Uh, but in other stories related to uh, robots and our relationship with them, not necessarily are the robots in our image. So this becomes a significant question as to what does this mean if, you know, if these robots that do not look like, less, like us, could they, you know, what would it mean if we started to exploit them? Or what if they actually gain so much capacity or ability that they can exploit us? or take over us, right? So certainly there is the, and certainly in folk psychology or in the folk, in the folk um, societal sense that there's that image of robots taking over humanity, completely destroying civil human civilization. Uh, as someone who is in the artificial intelligence world, I'm gonna say this right now, they're not gonna take over <laughs> our humanity. Um, we're very far from that world, if even possible. And we will certainly cover as to why that that is the case. Um, but certainly in the fictional world, we can imagine, you know, what would it mean if they took over our capacities? And what does that mean for the end of our civilization or not? So keeping these three questions in mind, I, I want you to, um, when, you know, when you read the text in the next couple of weeks, you, you consider this because then this will come up into our conversations. 
So robots, even though the word is a century old, the concept is certainly not new. Uh, it really has been since the beginning of humankind. And so we can really go back into ancient history and early folklore and see that even from, for example, and again, these are just examples, there are many more, but in Greek mythology, if you're familiar with uh, Pygmalion's ivory statue, this is actually a, this is a screenshot from Wikipedia of this uh, statue representing um, Galatea, who was brought to, uh, to life out of the love of her sculptor. This sculpture is actually housed here uh, in, um, in the Baltimore Museum of Art. So if you are in the Baltimore area and when museums are finally open, please do check this out. Um, so this is the idea of the, uh, that there is an ivory statue that is brought to life. So coming from a non-organic material, so a, um, a solid becoming a human-like individual. Um, Hephaestus, if you're uh, familiar with that uh, mythology, it was the god of goldsmiths, and this god actually employed several automata to help in his workshop. So one example is that Hephaestus was known for having a three-legged self-navigating table that could go around and help with his um, blacksmithing work. There's Talos, which was a known uh, bronze automaton, which was meant to protect uh, Europe from pirates and invaders. So again, it's this concept here, it's the concept of having this uh, robotic figure, um, human-like robotic figure, that was meant to actually protect humans from other humans. Another, if we look in Jewish folklore, we have Golem. So this uh, image right here is a screenshot of this idea of having an animated anthropomorphic being that's created from clay. So here, simply the idea that we have a solid substance that is in the image of the human and that has, and that is animated and has human-like capacities and qualities. If we look to Japanese 17th to 19th century, the uh, Karakuri Liguyu uh, puppets for entertainment. So the image right here these were used specifically um, to, in theatrical productions, precisely to entertain the public. So again, this concept that we could create human-like qualities into something that is non-human, and that can be part of our society, in this case, for a very positive uh, effect of providing a sort of entertainment. As I mentioned, there are many more examples, but simply this is to give you an idea that this is something that we've been asking as human beings for a very long time. And we are particularly, the readings we're gonna be looking at are gonna be from the early 1800s all the way up to the 1990s. Um, and so we are gonna focus really more on the 19th century and technological advances. And we're gonna see that science and engineering are now going to be affecting our concept of robots or anthropomorphic beings over the concept of magic or divinity. So we're really gonna, uh, and that's why uh, when we start to read our authors next week, I'm gonna make sure that I set up the scientific and technological background because you will see how science is now going to be informing the way writers think about uh, these robotic anthropomorphic beings. With respect to famous literary robots, uh, there's certainly the Sorcerer's Apprentice coming from Lucian of Samosata from the first century AD. So um, this is one of the first-ish, I, I, I'm always hesitant when you say one of the first simply because we're always finding new um, pieces of evidence otherwise. But um, in terms of this concept of supernatural animated brooms, so this was certainly not related to um, humans in terms of uh, in the human image, but it's the idea that objects could be animated and act like humans. Then there's uh, Hoffman's mechanical singing puppet, Olympia. We're actually gonna be reading this story, The Sandman. So this is uh, from Germany in 1816. And this is really interesting because we're gonna see how we're now talking about an object that is made in the image of a human being and it's human controlled, but it does not have any cognitive awareness. 
but just keep that as a dot, 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 because we will return to that. We will also return to uh, Mary uh, Shelley's, of course, Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus of 1818. And what becomes fascinating about this work, and specifically the sections we're gonna be reading, is what does it mean when the human takes on the role of creator, creating another human-like being? And what does that mean with respect to creating this image, this being, not only physically, but cognitively? So keep that also as a dot, 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 because we'll get back to that next week. Um, there's also uh, Edward Ellis's The Steam Man of the Prairie, so 1868. Uh, this is a screenshot of the, um, of the book that came out at the time. Um, and this was specifically about a bipedal anthropomorphic mechanism that was human controlled and had no sense, uh, had no possibilities of autonomy. So could not act on its own. Another uh, very famous uh, example, you may have read this, this is more in the children's books, but of course this has had profound impact um, on adult literature. So um, Lyman Frank Baum's Ozma of Oz of 1907, right? So the TikTok character. So this was a humanoid mechanical man with three clockwork movements force. Now this is really interesting. So now look at the dates. We're now in the um, early part of the 1900s and we have the capacity for thinking, speech, and movement. So also keep this as a dot, 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 because I'm going to bring um, the scientific background as to why this would already be entering into the literature. And so because it was a clockwork a mechanism, it had to be wound up. If we move further into the 1900s, so 1938, there's the really um, famous Lester Del Rey's Helen O'Loy. So this now is the concept of looking at the domestic robot that is specifically built to do household chores. Um, and in typical fashion of science fiction uh, with respect to this genre, uh, the creator ends up falling in love with its, uh, with its robot. Um, then we have Isaac Asimov's Runaround, so 1942, where we have the formal introduction of three laws of robotics that I am gonna cover today. Uh, then we have uh, Philip Dick's Blade Runner. So do androids dream of electric sheep? You obviously may know about the film um, version of this, so 1968. And now we have the question of, that really starts to come up, which is what does it mean to be human? And now the question of empathy. So is empathy only a human trait? So now realize that I'm entering, now I'm starting to mention the questions of emotions. See, this also is a dot, dot, dot. So when we get to the literature of the 1950s, this will be really important because I will talk about uh, the birth of cognitive science and how that's related to how we start thinking about cognitive awareness in, in robotic machines. Then there's Ira Levin's The Set for Wives, which has been made into a film, uh, but the, the, the story came out in 1972. And this was uh, also, unfortunately, in typical fashion of the genre, simply because most of the writers have been male in this particular work. It's about men's um, submissiveness and uh, men's submissive beautiful robotic wives. So men uh, having access to robots that are in the female form and who are purely for the sake of male pleasure. This is uh, an interesting concept because it is something that also crosses across, not just in the English language world, but we also see this in um, the non-English language world. Um, another very important, significant individual to look at is Kobo Abe. We will be reading selections from his uh, Inter-Ice Age Forest story. But actually in 1954, he wrote the invention of R62, Perpetual Moon, and he was asking these questions of, remember the three that I mentioned, of job loss from technology. So what happens when robots enter into the scene and they start replacing uh, human workers um, because of their efficient capacity and their speed capacities? Um, Inter-Ice H4, I won't mention anything about it because we will delve much more into it. Um, and then in the 1960s, he wrote One More Like You. So here, he also, similar to the Helen O'Roy um, example I, I gave in the previous slide, he looks at it from a different perspective, from the female perspective, and he actually has here uh, a character of a wealthy woman who orders 
uh, a robotic self of, of, you know, a robotic version of herself to do chores and things certainly do not go as planned. Uh, there's also Chinchi Hoshi, Boko-chan, a very famous work by this author about a robotic female bar hostess. And so this is the idea of having, unfortunately, again, these writers are mainly coming from the male perspective um, in which the robot is seen in a female image. And so it certainly goes through a whole um, adventure of, of love um, in this story and really questioning what that means. 1961, we have um, Kurashami's Artificial Beauty. And in this case, this actually becomes, um, starts merging into the question of synthetic beings, um, genetically engineered beings. This is also a question that Kobo Abe addresses in, in his Inter Ice Age 4 story. Um, but in this particular uh, artificial beauty story, we have a wife and husband who buy a robotic housemaid uh, and things actually turn out to be quite completely unexpected. And it turns out that, um, it tur that that robot, what was presumed to be a robot actually was a human and the human husband was actually a robot. So that is really a fascinating story in terms of maybe we can get to the point where we can no, lo lo no longer even distinguish ourselves from robots. And that, of course, presupposes a lot of cognitive capacity and then also our capacity of humans to translate our cognitive capacities into software and hardware, right? So that these um, beings can really be like us. 1970s, we have Tutsusi's Narcissism and Sadism. Uh, this also following these uh, concepts of uh, designing robots for men's uh, needs, but more moves into the question of intellectual property. So what happens when you create these robots that maybe do not look like you, but also look like you, so you have two different types, right? Those that don't, those that do look like oneself. And what happens when they now take over your role, your, uh, your role in society or other humans' role in society? So what does this mean for the products that they create? So what does this mean for intellectual property issues at the legal uh, level? And so, Again, I'm just giving you um, just a list here of other authors. Um, unfortunately, not all of this work has been translated into English, um, but so that you are aware that this is a global uh, question that has been asked. And, um, and again, with some of the readings we read uh, that are from the non-English world, of course, English translations, uh, this will, hopefully you'll see that all these merging questions um, are really, uh, informed not only by science and technology, but by culture. And I'm going to make sure that that comes, that that is clear when we discuss those readings. Now, moving all the way uh, back to the uh, early 1100s. Uh, uh, so we have Al Jazeera's uh, machine book. So what I'm referring to really is the book of knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices. If you're not aware of it, I completely suggest you to, to look it up. It is a fantastic book um, in which Al Jazeera, who was uh, from Turkey, uh, what is now known as Turkey, um, and he was a polymath and he was an engineer, an inventor, a draftsman, uh, an artist, uh, a writer, uh, a designer. And this book was really a fantastic, it is a fantastic compilation of a lot of descriptions of previous automata a robotic, not again, not necessarily in the human form, but robotic um, robot, uh, robots, items, clockwork devices, and other types of devices. And he literally describes prior to his time and also a lot that he designed in the moment and that he constructed himself. And he, this is perhaps, maybe now this is the first record, now this is written record of complex, programmable humanoid automata. And I, I bring this up because it tends to be uh, neglected when we think about robots um, simply because it was not in English, it was in Arabic, um, but really just as a, as a beautiful example of Muslim and just far Eastern uh, technological advances that were happening at this time, and they were going to be significant to what we probably are more familiar to the Western 
uh, technology from coming into the Renaissance, which I'm going to address in a moment. Uh, but this was the precursor to a lot of the Western development that we see uh, further and specifically in the medieval and uh, Renaissance times. Um, so with respect to Al Jazeera's machine book, he was heavily influenced um, by classical Byzantine and Chinese writers. So Su Song, this image uh, right here that I'm uh, circling here with the cursor comes from Su Song. It's uh, one of the first known clockwork devices. And uh, it is important to bring up because this, what I'm saying here is that we're talking about advanced technological advancement in the Asian world, um, particularly from this also Chinese polymath like Al Jazeera was an inventor, an engineer, a draftsman, a writer, philosopher. Um, and so, Al Jazeera uh, had access to this and actually documents a lot of this work in his own book and then uses it to inspire his own stuff. Uh, later, we see that conical valves, segmental gears, um, they actually first appeared in Al Jazeera's work. So the diagram underneath here is, um, we're gonna see a little video of um, uh, a device he created of humanoid musicians. So robotic musicians that could play on a boat for uh, people who were at a cocktail party and they could have live musicians. So instead of having live human musicians, they would have automata musicians to play for them. And I bring this up because perhaps we're more familiar with the Italians as we enter into the 1300s all the way to Leonardo da Vinci, um, in which these particular gears and valves that we see from the, the Italian, the Western uh, technological advancement had actually come from Al Jazeera's work. Um, and of course, Al Jazeera's work had come from previous um, Byzantine and um, Chinese work. So again, I just want to make clear that really we, the history of robotics is a human history um, and it is across the globe. I am now gonna share with you a, um, a great animation of Al Jazeera's uh, work. And there, there is no sound to it. It's simply um, a visual, a digital rendition that has been done of what Al Jazeera proposed with respect to this, the set of musicians who would be playing a programmed set of pieces of music to uh, a, a, to a garden party, it was suggest he actually suggests this in his in his work. Um, and what's great about the simulations, they go inside and they show you how this particular device works. And I bring this up because um, I, I find this fascinating that one of the humanoid automata created would be musicians um, that we that we know of. And to me, that's just fascinating because if you think about what musicians or what musicianship is about, what the music is about, it's a very human uh, capacity. It's very, and okay, so really observe here how it's uh, functioning um, the uh, with respect to the gears and um, the water powered system that is allowing for this. And the different instruments. So he had here the tam a tambourines, uh, sort of like a, a horn flute type um, instrument and harp. Um, it was pre-programmed. So what it means is that it did not, it could not play any music. It's simply the music that it had been programmed to, to play. Um, so that is going to become interesting uh, for us today because um, I'm not going to cover it. But if you're interested, I can certainly share some links to how we have progressed. Okay, so moving forward, um, Mondino de Lucy, so Italian, um, really important. The reason why I'm mentioning him is because he introduced public dissections of human cadavers in Bologna, Italy in 1316. This is really important because, as we will see with respect to the humanoids, robotic humanoids being made, this level of knowledge of human anatomy is extremely important to then how we create uh, human, actual human-like um, 
robots. And so again, simply for historical purposes, I think it's important to, to know that uh, the Lucy's work of, on the human, the anatomy of the human corp uh, corpus body uh, that came out in 1316 would become the manual, literally the handbook um, of dissection and would remain the book of anatomy for 200 years plus. So this means entering into the time of da Vinci's work um, since it's publishing. And the reason why it became so important this particular work is because it actually asserted the importance of thinking and understanding and looking at the human being um, as, and I put this in quotes, as superior to other creatures. Um, and I put this in quotes simply because we, and that's a whole other class if we were to talk about intelligence, um, I would simply say that we have different type of intelligence from other um, animals. Um, but in, in his particular work, he really um, made the claim that humans are superior with respect to other creatures simply because of our intellect and our capacity to reason, our capacity, um, to, to, to be able to think. And this is gonna be really important because despite this breaking down of the human body, we really wouldn't ask the question of cognition until the 1950s. And that would have impact into the literature around that time and not so much during the time of the early 1800s of the literature we're gonna read. Um, da Vinci uh, certainly had a lot of contributions um, many that are still having entire impacts into multiple disciplines. I just want to focus really uh, briefly on his contributions to neuroscience simply because this is going to have an effect into what we read. Um, and so he uh, made many studies on sensory physiology and he was all about identifying uh, how the physical brain actually interprets sensory stimuli. And so he also, like uh, Mondino de Lucy, he focused on observation and experience. So he really went in and also dissected cadavers. It wasn't just about reading or it wasn't about um, imagining worlds. He really wanted it, it, truly a scientific perspective here. And so dissections at this point were common, so he certainly would go in and all of all his notes he literally, we can in a way almost think of him as uh, the father of, of modern neuroscience because what he ended up drawing here would have an enormous impact into the field of modern neuroscience of the, from the early um, 1900s and forward. And again, these are just screenshots from his, um, from his works and we can see how very similar his drawings are to today's work. Um, and he would uh, discover the ventricles of the brain are responsible. Uh, well, he would argue that it's for uh, its major functions. Um, he, would, he ended up, he claimed that the soul resides in the head. So the idea that the brain is really the seat of, um, of the soul here. And I'm going to merge this forward to uh, of cognition. Um, and, but he said it was in the, in, inside these ventricles, which uh, certainly is not the, the case. But What's important is that he would identify these ventricles um, and he would create um, really uh, interesting new techniques to identify this and he would actually use wax to create a cast of the brain to be able then to draw and further not just dissect but create models of the, of the brain. And I'm talking now physiology, not cognition. Um, so this is interesting because uh, when, we, when we look at further into da Vinci's work, he actually, uh, ventured into the robotic field. Um, certainly he was an engineer and individual, but I think it's important to think in terms of not just the, his, the structures he thought of and for flight um, and for designing um, for uh, ballistics and uh, bridges, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when we look at creatures moving, so this idea of animated beings. Um, so cre he created this, what's known as the mechanical lion. It is a structure that is able to walk and um, can present flowers at the end of it so it does a performance. Um, and it ends up opening up its chest where flowers end up coming out. I'm gonna show you a video on that in a moment. Um, and so it, it's uh, documented that he actually presented this to the King of France. Um, and we're not so much sure as to why he did it, but perhaps it was to, to show off his, um, his engineering capacities, or perhaps it was some sort of diplomatic gesture at the time. Um, during a, a banquet that was hosted uh, 
in uh, by Florentine merchants um, and Giuliano de' Medici, right? So one of the major sponsors of um, many of the artists um, and artisans uh, and polymaths of the of the Renaissance in Florence, Italy. And so this was done in Lyon, in France, um, in 1515. So I'm gonna share a really quick video that I think is just fascinating to watch because um, it's not a great uh, copy, uh, but I'll turn the volume down, but this is actually from a museum exhibit um, this is a, a video of the video that was running in the museum um, and that shows here the structures and the replicas that have been made of this particular structure and you can see then here it's going to, it's, the line is performing its performance um, and is going to, um, here comes the gesture, is going to provide the uh, flowers to the king. So as you can see here, I mean, it's not a very extravagant, um, uh, there we go. So it's not, a, 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 you know, an extravagant, um, uh, it doesn't have cognition here in that sense um, device, but it's a fantastic device in the sense that all these gears and mechanisms that we would see that we briefly touched upon, but if you go and look into Al Jazeera's work would be Use so Da Vinci was influenced by that work. He would devise this and um, would use it to create this animated lion. And so, for purposes of time, I'm not going to go through the whole video, but I will certainly share this with you so you can so you can go through it. The next um, fascinating also work that Da Vinci did is the self-propelled cart. You can pretty much think of this as the the, the pre-version of the automobile, really. Um, and so this is in his work of the Codex Atlanticus. Um, so uh, dates in which it was created, probably around 1978, uh, 1478, sorry, 1490, between uh, 1480 uh, time period. So this is, um, Leonardo was still uh, young and he was uh, in working in theaters. And so it seems to be that this, Part was for the purpose of helping with theatrical productions. Um, and so what's great about it is that it could be programmed. Um, so you would wind it up with certain springs and then it would, and then it also had a, a lever system in which it could go and move from one location to another and carry X um, number of items. Another interesting, and here going back to the concept of the humanoid robot. Um, so now we can, think of this as uh, the first recorded humanoid robot. So I mentioned Al Jazeera is perhaps one of the first recorded. That was simply because we had the musicians that were human-like. I'm gonna say maybe then Da Vinci is, um, we should really say is the second recorded. Um, perhaps, uh, so second in terms of in the history of robotics, but in the Western uh, history, then it's the first recorded humanoid robot of 1495. And so what was fascinating about this structure, he did not actually, I believe he did not actually create the entire thing. He simply wrote out all of the gears and pulley systems required for it. And he created many sketches. And what's great about it is that um, more recently, so the Leonardo lab in, um, in Italy, in Milano, Milan, Italy, uh, recently took Da Vinci's sketches and recreated the model and it works to perfection. So what's fascinating is that even though Da Vinci did not actually create that physical structure in its entirety, he laid out all the mechanical engineering principles and what was also so precise because of his work on human dissections, he was able to create it to human proportions. The importance of looking at an individual who understands science, uses scientific method to then incorporate it into his uh, designs and ultimately today with the full creation of his, um, of his hypotheses really of his designs, we would see something that actually works. Again, this is a machine that worked in terms of looking like a human perhaps acting like a human in terms of moving up arms, legs, and sitting down, 
but does not have higher order cognition. Uh, so we move now, I'm gonna fast forward simply because when we get to uh, next week, our stories, I will give a more um, direct history about the 1800s, um, but move to 1927. So with Herbert Televox, um, this is now in terms of when we think of modern day technology, probably now the first humanoid robot in that sense, which was built by Ron Wesley at Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company, uh, based here in the uh, United States in Pennsylvania in their uh, factory. And so this particular robot could answer the phone, utter a few weird buzzes or grunts and noises, um, was completely uh, speechless until they were able to um, program its capacity to just um, elicit two types of uh, sentences. And so they improved this particular uh, machine, uh, humanoid, to what is now I'm gonna call the real first humanoid robot um, in modern sense of the Electro, called Electro, the Motor Man in 1937. So with this particular structure, what I love about it and his little, and, um, his little dog, uh, Sparko, um, is that, and, we're, and I'm gonna give examples of where we are today with respect to um, actual animated dogs uh, that currently are being created in Japan now, um, and highly intelligent, and I'll put this in quotes, um, and I'll talk about what that means um, in, in the following weeks. Um, but fascinating, again, we saw the internal mechanism of little Sparko and of the robot, and you see that Leonardo da Vinci, right, how much, so how many centuries later, right? So how forward thinking Al Jazeera prior to da Vinci, da Vinci and then all the way to today, how much of their work was really pioneering at the time because we would end up using really a, that as a foundation to what um, now uh, we're heading into. And then um, finally, there's Isaac Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics have come out in 1941. Uh, they would be uh, also, so not only in Roundabout, but in his short story, Liar, um, also I, Robot, probably the more famous work in 1950, and then Bicentennial Man, of course, of 1976, in which there have been uh, movies of these uh, particular stories. Um, and so what's interesting, I bring this up, is because these three laws are, um, the point of it was that they considered the best safety restrictions a robot could be programmed to abide. To, and this is fascinating to think about because when we fast forward to today, 2020, these three laws are fundamental, have become the foundational elements with which we now are discussing the question of what does it mean to create these higher thinking, ordered, smart uh, type of machines that are not only interacting with us, but that are indeed replacing particular of our capacities. And so um, I would just mention these three laws. I want you to keep them in the back of your mind if you're not already familiar with them. So one, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey any orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict the first law. And the third being a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict the first or second law. So what's also fascinating about these laws is that they're very much like us human beings, right? So it's the idea that, you know, for the first one, a robot may not injure a human being, right? So the idea that we as human beings, right, we do not have the right, right, to go and injure somebody else, harm somebody else, to kill somebody else, right? That's a legal issue. So the same elements that are important to us in terms of who we are as human beings is also, look how we're now sort of mirroring that, reflecting it onto these beings that we are creating. And this would become foundational in the 19, um, uh, really 50s of when, and now to today, and it was kind of died down. So the next slide here is really just 1950s today. I'm gonna leave this as a dot, 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 because I am gonna return to this in week three with the birth of uh, cognitive science and also looking at Alan Turing's work prior to the birth of cognitive science of the 1940s, and then the birth of cognitive science in 1956, in which we will, um, I'll talk about what this means in terms of the cognitive side of thinking about robotics, and then what we have currently built today that is very uh, sophisticated, and um, that will challenge, I think, really our concepts of what we want with these machines. 
So I'm going to stop right here. I mean, so I can just open it to you. Um, and if there are any uh, questions or comments that you would like to make um, that uh, you want to bring up, please go ahead. You can write it in the chat or uh, if possible, raise the little icon hand and we'll, we'll you know, let, you, yeah, let you speak or just go ahead and, and speak up. So any questions, comments, um, anything to add? Again, I certainly fast forward super quick. Um, it's, uh, th there's much more to it, as you can see, it's very complex. Um, but I wanted to make sure we had this historical uh, background so that when we start reading for next week, uh, the, the Sandman, Der Sandman, right? So the, the German short story and uh, of Offman and uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, that um, you have this in the back of your mind. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I will certainly introduce the authors and I will also introduce the uh, scientific uh, milieu, right, landscape so that we see whether or not, so not necessarily it is the case that authors will bring in the actual science that's happening at the time. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Certainly I will argue that today's works do. Um, and certainly those authors who are scientists and also literary artists do that. Um, and so that's a, that's a whole nother question, right? In terms of how we even create uh, science fiction, what does that mean? I also will introduce the concept of science fiction. I've sort of used it right now very loosely. Um, and that's not a term to be used loosely simply because uh, there are different kinds and genres. And um, right, so it's just, uh, it, I will clarify that um, further because um, I think that's important too. Uh, so all right, um, so there's just a, a quick comment here. So curious if you have been to the Schloss, uh, oh, I love, I can't see it. So the Schloss Elbow in Salzburg with all of its water power mechanical scenes. No, I haven't. And um, how embarrassing because I have been um, in Salzburg in the Schloss Leopoldskron, um, which is where they filmed the, uh, the Sound of Music. And I haven't been there and I heard about it and I was in such a tight time frame because um, I was in the global seminar there and I, I, I missed it. So, but no, and I want to go. So thank you for reminding me. I will next time. Yes, I, I was told about that. Um, and that's, yeah, so uh, apparently, yeah, with the paramechanical singing birds, uh, it, it's apparently beautiful. Um, yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen it. Um, I did see actually um, not too long ago when I was in Venice, um italy and they had an exhibit it was uh, about it was like five levels um of completely devoted dedicated to leonardo da vinci's work and it had all the models that have been made of his drawings and his devices and i have to say that i mean i knew leonardo da vinci had uh really um created the the, the um have been the first medical illustrator slash scientist because back prior to his time medical uh, doctors would hire illustrators to do their medical illustration but he was the first to actually do his own dissections and do his own illustrations um, and I knew he had been the father of modern um, flights right of, um, and uh, of the bridges he had done but I hadn't realized that Leonardo da Vinci really he created um, the foundation for everything, um, for the machine gun, uh, for life-saving equipment, um, for, you know, those automated uh, pianos, um, it just uh, the automobile, um, the highly, you know, those saws that are used for um, highly nuanced work, or woodwork or metallic work, he created all of that. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, it, it's fascinating to see that. Another question here is, uh, is the concept of robots necessarily a product of cultures with mind body do oh yeah okay um are there any examples of pre-modern robotic fictions and cultures that don't have stress okay yeah so that okay that's a fascinating question with respect to um yes yeah, so the dualism mind versus body mind and body um i will say that culture is definitely a um has an effect on the stories however having read 
so many of these humanoid stories, science, I'm gonna put under science fiction stories from the world. I will say that it doesn't matter the culture or the language, the question of what it means to be human beyond the body. So really the cognitive question, the emotional question, the higher order thinking reasoning question is universal. And so that says a lot to me because at the end of the day, it really goes to show that as much as we have cultural differences, I mean, we really are one and the same as human beings. And the fact that the stories would reflect that in even how we think about our technological versions of ourselves um, really uh, is, goes to show that we, we know as human beings that our mind, brain, um, body, and I'm gonna put it all as um, together here, is what makes us unique. Um, it's, it's our emotional capacity that makes us unique and to understand others, to be with others, to tell stories to each other. I think that, I think that is what is, uh, it doesn't matter the culture, the language, um, they all have that. Um, okay, so uh, it be, uh, there was one other thing before we close. How about postmodern robot? Yeah, well, haha. -ha. Um, we're gonna address that when we get to the, um, when we get to our final story. That's a dot, 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 I promise we will get to that. Um, yes, so okay, we're now our past our time. So thank you very much. I will see you next week for um, our first set of readings. So again, it's not, I mean, if you don't do it, that's okay. But it would be lovely if you could so that we can have a, a, really, a really, I wanna hear from you guys as well. Um, because, you know, always different minds, different perspectives um, leads to creating a much wealthier human human um, experience. And that's what this class is really all about. So thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the, um, well, really weekend. Um, and I will see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.